Today I want to talk about consumerism and about a couple of sociological concepts that contribute to the discussion. We'll be talking about McDonaldization, about the concept of Disneyization, and about the role Romanticism plays in the development of our consumer culture. Further, I want to give you a discussion point on the role of the customer in our society. I will quickly go through um, three very important basic concepts concerning consumerism and what sociology can teach us about it. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, McDonaldization, about Disneyization, and about the role that Romanticism has in developing a consumer culture, which is quite interesting, as you will see. So, beginning with McDonaldization, uh, we are talking about a um, concept that goes back to uh, the publication of the, the McDonaldization of Society, a book by a, a sociologist called George Petzer, who thought about uh, consumer society and consumerism and how um, uh, we have in capitalism and modern capitalism developed uh, a specific a new co uh, consumption culture that can be very well understood if we, if we take a closer look at how McDonald's work. This is not merely a metaphor. McDonald's is actually the epitome of, of McDonaldization, of a consumer culture that is um, highly rational, controlled, uh, efficient, um, and, and uh, because it's very profitable. You can actually see how McDonaldization works by, by, by taking a look at um, an actual McDonald's. If you go there, you can see, look behind uh, the, uh, the, the counter and see what they do in the kitchen. Uh, and uh, Ritzer describes this as basic principles, not only of production and consumption with uh, McDonald's, but in general. And he claims that this is uh, characterized, any consumer close uh, business will have a tendency to sooner or later end up with a culture that is very close to McDonald's. So that is characterized by five tendencies, rationality, control, predictability, calculability, and efficiency. So Ritzer claims uh, that this is an expression of the overall tendency that we've already encountered in general discussion and very specifically with Max Weber's uh, approach to modernization, that is the tendency towards rationalization of being central in in the process of modernization. And um, uh, Ritzer claims that if you look at how the work process and consumption process is organized at a McDonald's, you'll see that it's highly rationalized. And I think that's true. Uh, even the customer is part of this almost conveyor belt-like line of consumption. Uh, this uh, uh, goes hand in hand with an extremely high level of control of every step. Uh, everything is predictable, everything is uh, uh, calculable up until the last cent. You know exactly how long it will take to go from the uh, deep fr uh, French fried to uh, the packing, to the serving, to the paying, um, and uh, approximately how long it takes per customer uh, to eat them and then to have the next customer in the restaurant. This uh, is highly efficient and uh, is a way that you, for example, have an entire that this yo sushi is, is, is organized exactly by the same princip principles. And you will find ample examples of, of um, other companies that are close to consumer section that are organized just like it. And this is what Ritzer calls McDonaldization, a general tendency in our culture of consumption. The second thing that I want to discuss with you is uh, a concept that's brought up uh, to the discussion by a man called uh, Alan Bryman, a sociologist who also studied the consumer culture, and he focuses on an aspect that he calls Disneyization. Disneyization of society is the title of his book, uh, came out in the early 2000s, and um, it focuses on uh, the culture of consumption that is um, very comparable to what you can observe, not at McDonald's, but at a Disney park. If you take a look at a Disney park also, there, there are specific principles that are very um, clear and transparent to see um, that apply. Um, 
So he would uh, would uh, uh, say that the general tendency is for consumption to go towards uh, what is organized in theme, the Disney's theme park, parks and transfer to other uh, amusement parks, to to restaurants, hotels like uh, the Wild West theme in Hotel Chien, um, shopping malls, very importantly, or even zoos and museums. Um, and he bases this um, on a tendency of unhappy people, people who are discontented with their life in modernity, uh, in their private life, in their, in their work life, in their public life, um, discontented, uh, but uh, bound to then try to compensate for this in escapism, which uh, uh, they try to find by, by finding other worlds they can emerge in uh, there where they can find uh, a, a sense of happiness or at least content um, that they can find in their in their uh, societal life and uh, those scenes of this crime would be institutions like planet uh, uh, Hollywood or hard rock cafe uh, other restaurants uh, malls um, and so on and so forth and one of the basic principles of how that is, why that is being done is because it's profitable. And it's profitable because uh, it's basically ways of keeping the customer longer and making them more, um, spend more money. And uh, therefore, by having them consume more, uh, being able to sell more to them. The four principles uh, that we'll be looking at are, um, in detail, are theming, are hybrid consumption, um, a third is uh, the principle uh, of merchandising and number four is emotional labor and I'll get to each one of them now. So theming is something that you will uh, see, for example, if you have a new uh, blockbuster coming out, then you'll have McDonald's reacting with theming that their burgers around that blockbuster, be that Pirates of the Caribbean number, I don't know, 17 or which part it is by now. And um, uh, then you'll have pirate burgers and fish sticks that are, I don't know, from whatever, from the Caribbean. Um, it's, you can see that I don't really like that culture, but it's, uh, 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 it is um, grouping your sales around a specific theme that they all uh, kind of relate to in different dimensions. For example, you know, music or the soundtrack or the movie itself or then a musical or uh, a book about it or a burger theming on that or and so on and so forth and um, this already implies and points towards the second element and that's hybridization hybrid consumption is a consumption that merges the experience that you have with your taste buds, with your smell, with your eyes, visuals, with your ears, what you hear, what you sensorially experience, uh, all into different aspects of one experience. And this experience um, could be uh, selling you anything from a t-shirt to a concert. Um, uh, you would find uh, typically that this is a way of selling more to you, um, giving you opportunities to consume as much as possible. The third tendency is a tendency towards merchandising everything. So you will find that um, you can um, sell more uh, if you not only make a movie or, 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 or a new record a new record, but also sell the t-shirt to it and the jacket to it and uh, the rings and earrings and uh, books and stickers and what have you to it. So for example, here is a, is a Disney shop uh, where, you can, where you can buy Disney related stuff or, or a, a, a actual clothesline of Harry Potter. The fourth aspect is emotional labor. Emotional labor is a part of Disneyization that maybe the, the spookiest is for the people who work there in, for example, a Disney park. They always have to keep smiling and have to make sure that the customer is having a positive emotional experience. So they make it personal and they make it positive. Uh, they make it welcoming. They make it warm. They make it friendly. And they do it by not only smiling on the outside because an artificial smile 
is not really going to give a customer a positive experience, right? It's rather spooky and unpleasant. Uh, uh, we'll look at the recording later, what that looks like. Definitely not pleasant. But it has to come from the inside. Let me try and give you an, an authentic, authentic smile. Now, in order to do this, I need to, ex I need to feel, I don't know, probably looks creepy. I'm not a good actor. Anyhow, um, it needs to be felt on the inside to give it to others on the outside. This is something that the sociologist of work, uh, Ruth Hochschild, uh, 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 worked about. Uh, you, you'll find her in the book of uh, Sociology, book two, just as these authors are of them. And uh, it's something that is exhausting. Um, uh, in terms of acting, it's close to what we know as method acting. It's something that was developed by a Russian um, uh, director uh, called Stanislavski, and it's the Stanislavski method, or the method in short, that is dominating the American uh, markets of, 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 of acting. And uh, guys like Dustin Hoffman and, and Robert De Niro and, 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 and Al Pacino, they're, they're all method actors. So they, they first produce within themselves what they then um, give to the audience on the outside. And this gives it an authenticity and strength of expression that is unique, as opposed to other acting schools that actually are very rational and planned and calculating. I'll give you an example. One actor I know told me the story of one of his great heroes having one of the most dramatic scenes of his life where, uh, where uh, at the high point of a drama, I forget which drama it is, somebody I think hears about the death of somebody, a some loved person or something like that, and he turns around and uh, what the audience sees is the guy getting the news and then turning around away from the audience and then he would see and hear the following But what you did not see is that the person was not, I hope you could see that, is that the person was not actually crying, but standing there and looking at his wristwatch, because that's what he saw from, from behind the scenes, and shaking his wrists and counting. One, two, three, four. So um, that's a different uh, way of acting. But method acting is something that you process through the inside and which is very, very emotionally challenging and draining. And it can actually cause depressions and burnouts to work in these fields where you can't constantly have to produce friendliness. Now, for your discussion, maybe you want to think about Christmas and apply the, uh, the four criteria of um, Disneyization to the way that Christmas is being celebrated in your country. Um, see whether, whether Christmas is a Disneyized experience. Okay. The third thing that we discussed is a very interesting concept and relates romanticism to consumerism. The basic claim is that romanticism is a cultural phase that begins with early modernization in the late 18th century, very late 18th, or mid to late 18th century, up until the 20th century. We have composers, artists, writers, poets, uh, who are all romantics. And this would be the cultural ideology of the upcoming new middle class or bourgeoisie and petite bourgeoisie. Um, that uh, would be the driving forces of the spirit of modernity or of modern capitalism, uh, and we'll discuss in a second why this would be so closely related. But this would then, this is the argument, be very closely knit with the culture that we have that is oriented to very similar values in consumerism, in capitalism. Let's see what the argument is. Now, in order to understand this, first you need to understand what the romantic notion is. Let's uh, ask ourselves, are you uh, romantics. So this is the popular notion of romanticism is not as a phase and epoch in, in, in cultural development, but as something that is an individual question towards you. Are you 
and adhere, do you adhere to the concept of romantic love? That means is your sexuality bound to uh, the implication of love? Is love um, um, uh, something that is an expression of belonging and that results in uh, eternal partnerships uh, that are bond, bonds of the individual's inner core, which is an essence that is something like a soul, which is actually partnered with the soul mate, uh, and that is the destiny of your belonging. This is a romantic concept of love you know, that you find ironized in postmodern films and still alive and kicking. Um, but um, in throughout modernity, one of the central themes of music and uh, art, literature and poetry. And um, it is new historically. Uh, previously, um, you would have love as nothing to do with marriage. Marriage would be a practical arrangement that would be about hereditary, about um, uh, who inherits what, how uh, property and power relations develop, um, and the most practical affair. Uh, the notion of marrying outside your caste or class, for example, a feudal and a civil, and or, or, or a, a rich and a poor person is a very romantic concept. That is because it's the inner soul that finds its mate. That is a rebellious concept of love in the context of feudalism, and it is a conservative concept today, because all those eternal concepts, they tend to freeze society in a snapshot in a given phase of history, that then moves on and leaves this snapshot behind, which becomes more and more something that is petrified, that is set in stone, and that is actually conservative or even reactionary. We've discussed that and we'll discuss it in the context of religion. Um, so, back to um, our topic. Romanticism is, uh, as I said, a cultural phase, an epoch uh, of our cultural development. And you find it expressed in, in um, uh, uh, concepts of the romantic hero, of sensitivity and rejection, uh, the idealization of beauty of nature, uh, the thematization of boredom, all this uh, is part of a reflex, as one might quite safely claim, to uh, modernity. Because it's the upcoming modernity and rationalization that makes everything so rational, that gives this reflex that technicizes everything, that educates everything, that makes everything a question of knowledge, uh, that gives the reflex of wanting back to nature, back to authenticity, to unlearned, to untrained, to original, authentic me and self individual expression. This is a very in, in the history of our psychology and it's closely connected to, to modern capitalism. Now, Romanticism uh, would be, for example, The Ninth by Beethoven or Sir Ivanhoe and the Black Knight the idealization, romantic idealization of knighthood, of very modern now also a samurai uh, who are horrible, horrible people, slaughterers, uh, beastly, beastly sadists, uh, <laughs> and they're being idealized as something noble. Um, Hunchback of Notre Dame, Mary Shelley and Frankenstein's monster, the British Parliament is the architecture of, of most romantic nature, which idealizes medieval architecture and kind of gives a uh, 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 this retro in the 19th century um, for what was the, the ideal time of the Middle, Middle Ages, which were nowhere close to the ideal. Here's an example from Johann Wolfgang Goethe, The Leiden des Jungen V, um, a novel that has killed more young people than any other book because it made suicide popular, romantic to kill yourself for love. Very, very stupid way of winning the Darwin Award. Look it up if you don't know the concept of the Darwin Award yet. I think I am. it's extremely despicable. But it was romantic and it was very in in those times. Um, he is a Goya a painter. He is the, he is the British Parliament. Um, uh, and uh, here is um, a quick um, uh, uh, look into the way that romantic painters would romanticize the authenticity of the Aborigine uh, Gauguin, which is, uh, might be argued, maybe even a bit of a racist concept. We'll discuss that later. So here's the concept. It says authenticity uh, is something you can purchase with 
consumer good, goods where you can self-actualize, where, where you can be intuitive and experience pleasure. Experience is a value in itself. Novelty is something that is important. All these petty bourgeois values can be bought and consumed in the shape and form of a consumer good. The only problem being is that once it's consumed, you're empty again and you need to self-actualize with something you buy then again, leading to a circle of consumption. We need to constantly buy, buy the newest and the newest, newest product in order to self-actualize. Uh, and that is how consumerism and capitalism go hand in hand. Now, the last point that I want you just to discuss is very briefly is that uh, capitalism is often claimed to be all about consumerism, but really it might be claimed that it's all about production and that consumerism is only the backside of capitalist production. We can claim this if we think about the duality or, or opposition of use value and uh, exchange value that we've discussed earlier, where we would said I can drink only that much coffee, approximately a liter a day, but I can have more money as endlessly. There is always a dollar more is a dollar better. But a liter more of coffee is definitely not a liter better. So you could claim that the use value that is so weirdly abused in consumerism is a consequence of its subsumption, subjugation under the dominance of the value of exchange value, which is the important capitalist part about things. Can you make money out of them? The second argument is that the uh, spirit of consumerism is also not in the driving seat because the driving forces of the development of capitalism are in production. Uh, labor dominating the value output, but also production being the dominating factor of who has a job and therefore is getting paid and therefore has money and to spend and therefore something to create demand with with which is the spirit of consumerism is not just a cultural thing is you have to have the money to buy the goods in order to be consumerist. So where does that money come from? From wages. Wages are under pressure because they're costly and uh, they are in contradiction to profits. So by lowering wages, but also by um, firing people, by buying new technology and using technological progress um, as a means of uh, raising profitability, you will see that wages are constantly under pressure because new technologies enable capitalists to fire people uh, by applying machinery that is cheaper to buy than it is to apply, uh, employ people. And if that is the case, then the idea that consumer is king is actually an illusion that um, is an ideology of um, capitalism and not really the truth of who is in the driver's seat. Uh, and with that, I'd like to close. I hope this was helpful, and I'm looking forward to our next session.